Banksy tried to destroy his art after it sold for 1.4 million. The shredded version just went for 25.4 million. And in fact, if you've been following this story, you probably remember uh, the essentially they brought this uh, thing out, they shredded it, and everyone's like, oh my God, what are you doing? And um, evidently, whoever bought this thing uh, ended up profiting on it quite a bit. From 1.4 to 25.4 is not a bad profit. Now, the question is, should we all be you know, buying art? Is this a good investment or is it just all a scam? Um, I want to be sharing some thoughts on this. I get your thoughts as well. And um, let's just jump right in. So I'm sure you guys have seen all over YouTube and stuff like that. It's something like a masterwork since it's saying, hey, you know, you can get involved in this art world. Uh, and uh, one of the things that's always a red flag is when they say this stuff like this. You're invited to join an exclusive community investing in blue chip art. And why is it a, a, a red flag is because, you know, just entering your email address to be part of the exclusive community means it's not exclusive. So <laughs> do be aware of that. Uh, now, you know, places like Masterworks, they're going to make the case that um, if you buy art, you know, it'll outperform the S&P. They're saying, you know, 13.8 percent compared to S&P of 10.2. Um, they're going to make the case it's also better than real estate and gold. Um, they'll also make the case that uh, it's good for inflationary periods, right? Estimated return of 13.5. Uh, all these numbers, uh, just be very leery of, be, be, take it with a grain of salt. It's a good way to say it. Um, however, uh, it's very interesting. They even break it down by artist. And the one that really stood out to me actually on here, and this is sort of like, you know, if you invest in, in a said artist, you know, which one returns the most, um, is actually uh, this George Kondo thing here is saying 39.3%. And um, this is a true story. Uh, I actually went to an event uh, in uh, Seoul, Korea. It was called Pro Rata. And they were actually one of the competitors to Masterworks. I think Masterworks might have bought them out. I, I don't, I'm not sure exactly sure, but I know that. Um, something happened. And in fact, I went to this thing because a couple of my friends uh, from university uh, basically were the founders. Um, there was a big event. I'm just telling you guys, I, I'm, I've been around this world. And um, essentially what they had, what they did, they had a George Kondo there and there's all these people taking pictures. They invited, you know, TV star, movie star, this kind of stuff, models and things. And um, also gave lots and lots of champagne <laughs> for reals. That's what it looked like. Uh, it was pretty good. And um, this is essentially what a thing looked up. And the thing that was really interesting about it is um, they were trying to convince people essentially to sort of buy a piece of it, buy a you know share, buy a stock, buy a portion of, of the ownership of it. Um, my wife and I, full disclosure, we, we went to this thing not knowing exactly what it was. Uh, we ended up not putting any money into it, but some people did, I'm sure. And, um, you know, we'll see uh, how they did. You know, it's me there at the thing. And uh, it's funny because I, I'm, I'm not against art by any stretch. Um, in fact, if you watch some of my earlier videos, this is a, a piece um, that we have is actually um, one of my wife's father's friends. They, they is an artist, and we got an original thing, and it, it's nice. Um, you know, it's not like we're we're not spending millions of dollars and stuff like that. But you know, um, something having something original um, is is kind of cool. Um, also, too, if you guys may not know, I used to work as an art director at a luxury hotel design company, and um, one of the things that we would do uh, is you would commission art. So, for example, you know, you may get like a sculpture like this, this kind of thing, right? You find an artist, you for how much the material costs, you for how much the time. It costs for said person to, you know, make said thing. And um, then you come up with a, a fair market price. And this is one of the things that with art, it's always kind of like, okay, so what's fair? And um, you could always make the case. This is something that you may say, you know, for any kind of, of service or any kind of object is it's worth what someone is willing to pay, right? Um, and don't think that, that this is a, a, a isolated thing, right? You have this thing all over the world, right? What is someone willing to pay? I'll give you another example. Um, this is a picture from the DC headquarters where they essentially um, make all the comic books for, for DC. Um, it was really cool. And uh, you're not really allowed to take pictures inside. And I'm just going to tell you how it is. Um, almost every uh, employee at, at DC, true story, has a ton of collectibles and figurines. There's also tons of original art there. And um, things do have value. But, you know, how do you value said things? Um, I'll give you an example. Um, so uh, I like these little figurine things myself. Um, I don't go crazy on this stuff. Um, I just don't because <laughs> we move around a lot and like, you know, you can like literally, you know, fill your whole desk and your whole room with this kind of stuff. But, you know, these kind of things, like, for example, um, you know, this could be like a hundred bucks, right? And it starts to add up. Or if you're into comic books, you write, this could be like another hundred bucks. The rest is actually 70, but you get my point. Um, if you want to go like crazy, you can get in a Pokemon. And uh, this is like the most expensive Pokemon was $369,000, right? So, you know, again, a lot of this stuff has to do with what's it worth? What is someone willing to pay for it? And one of the things that uh, happens as well, the more scarce something becomes, right, the more valuable it is. So like in, in his prior examples, uh, these aren't as scarce as, say, other things. They're not necessarily one of a kind. 
And um, if, if you study art at all, you'll probably know uh, Andy Warhol. Um, he did a bunch of interesting art sort of commentating on commercialism and, and pop art, these kind of things. And, you know, would paint these Campbell soup cans the same over and over and over again and was making statements about sort of modern life, essentially. And one of the things that I think is really fascinating is, too, there's a under interesting example. It's a Pierre, uh, Pierre Brasso, and, and this is kind of a funny example. It was basically a journalist uh, wanted to see, you know, what would happen if you give paintbrushes to a monkey, right? <laughs> it said monkey right there. And, um, you know, then take the uh, uh, art that was done by the monkey, put it up in a gallery, and to see sort of how the art world would, you know, appreciate it. And, and sort of like what you expect is when you put it in said gallery, then people are kind of like, have to come up with reasons of, of why, you know, they should like it. There were a few people that said, this looked like it was painted by a monkey. And indeed that it was. And um, it's a famous story and, and it's actually pretty funny, but it does bring in a question like, how do we value said things? And I, and I put this thing back in the original thing is like, well, it depends what somebody is willing to pay for it. Um, also too, uh, I, I would make the case of like, we talk about what is the value of art. So this is something like Indiana Jones kind of thing. If you're talking about like a relic, right? So antiquities, and, and like, say, for example, you find an object that has, you know, the, the origins of a particular religion. That certainly has value, right? So there is value in art. I don't want to think that, like, nothing has value. There, there is. There, there's cultural value in this kind of stuff, right? And some people, like, for example, um, I'll just call an example. Let's say you could buy the uh, Ark of the Covenant. Like, you could buy the thing, right? Like, it exists. Or you could buy the original, like, for example, Ten Commandments. Like, you could, like, buy these tablets or whatever, right? Just for example. Um, those, those would certainly have art and has a historical, cultural uh, significance. And you could say, man, I, I own the Ten Commandments. I got it hanging in my house, for example. I'm not saying I know where these are or they even exist, but you give my point. Um, also, too, you know, one of the things that was interesting and in, in a difficulty in the art world, because we're talking about whether or not this is a scam, uh, this is an example. Uh, this thing is called Salvador uh, Mundi. And it was interesting because um, there's a couple of controversies with this. And um, uh, one would be like, is this really a depiction of Jesus, right? So, for example, um, you know, if someone really knew what Jesus looked like and you had a painting of said thing, what would that be worth? Uh, also, too, was this really painted by Leonardo da Vinci? I, I was reading through this, and, and I guess um, there's some authenticity questions because it could have been painted by uh, one of his assistants. And so this goes back into all the, you know, what is someone willing to pay for it? And, and I'm also it's treading in the water of like, what is an inherent value of something, right? Because I would say the more then you get the more famous the artist uh, is, because sometimes um, some of these artists have bigger names than others, and that will carry more, quote, inherent value. But it's very different than something like, say, when we talk about like, stay socks in this channel or bods or something like that, because those sort of things generate cash in terms of like, you're buying ownership of a business. And here you're buying ownership of an object and the value comes from sort of its cultural significance and what you can sell it to someone else. And oftentimes the value is, is based on, for talking about uh, uh, fine art here, or, or you know, this really expensive art, um, sort of the market history of what it sold before. So it's a really fascinating thing. Um, and uh, one another example, for example, here's a Picasso stuff. Um, you also get into the world of like, you know, Vegas, these kind of things. And if you ever go to these kind of, you know, private auction stuff, uh, this is sort of what it looks like. So this would be Sotheby's. Um, they they do these things where they bring out this stuff. And, and one of the things that's fascinating is um, you never know exactly who is buying it. And you would never, never know who exactly is selling it. And if you wonder, you know, is that sketchy? Yes, it's very, very sketchy. But, but that's the world of that, that this sort of uh, art is in. And you're talking about quite a bit of money. Um, you know, for example, this is sort of what the art, what it looks like up here. And um, they have a, a, a more of a bigger one. And I actually think this one is pretty cool. I've never seen these before. And, and you know, for me, I, I understand, right? If this is indeed, and this is, you're always wondering, wondering about authenticity. If this indeed is like, a, you know, a real Picasso kind of thing, and I've never seen this before, and I actually think it looks pretty good. I think this would be worth, you know, real money. Um, here's another one, for example. I don't think this one is as good because you guys' opinion. And, and it's all in the eye of the beholder, right? The same way that, for example, I would like to have a little, you know, robot statue on my desk. Someone may have to want to, you know, might want to have a, a nice looking painting on the wall, the same way that you may hang up posters or any number of things. And I want you to think about how when you're buying something like this, this is a original, which is very, very different than, you know, buying something that's a replica. And there might be like, you know, a million replicas out there of, of said thing. There's something said for having uh, the original. I'm not saying necessarily it's inherently worth this, but if someone else is willing to pay for it and someone has the means, you know, why not? Um, some of the prices on this kind of stuff. So, 
uh, they were saying like what 40 million, 20 million, 68 million, just just kind of general ideas of, of where these things can go. Um, I also want to talk about say architecture because this has to do with art as well. Uh, for example, um, in Beijing, because uh, I was there uh, during the Olympic time and they were building um, what's, what's uh, sort of commonly known as the bird's nest, uh, which is basically the biggest stadium. They paid 423 million for these things. And it's kind of funny because like, um, if you're talking about say like, uh, you know, a, a stadium, um, is this a send then worth like 10 times more or equal to equivalent of 10 Picassos? Kind of like, like how do you value said things? Something like this though, uh, you're, you're putting in, you know, what's the value of someone's time, right? So, uh, so you can certainly make the case that Picasso's time, you, you know, is dead now, of course, but that his time to paint said things is, is worth, you know, more money than someone else. And, and the reason why I was bringing up like this one here, you know, what is someone's time and what is someone's talent? Like, take a look at like, you know, highest NFL, you know, paid players. Um, just, just so you guys give me an example. So like in Aaron Rodgers, you want him to come play for you. What is this? Like $50 million kind of thing. Russell Wilson, 50 million. And, and market, you know, sort of sets the, the price. Now, I would say that um, something like, for example, NFL player is different than art in a way. Um, because if you have said player on your team, uh, you can sell tickets, right? So it's, it's a business because people want to pay money to go, you know, see said players. And you can say, you know, for example, Super Bowl, I guess they're saying here that the um, ticket prices were like, you know, 5,800, something like that. Um, and, but, but again, though, this still relates back to it. I mean, all based on, on a certain premise is what is something worth? Well, what is something willing to pay for it, right? I mean, I mean, I think a lot of it really rides on that kind of thing. You know, I'll give you another example. So I saw this one. This is Michael Jordan jersey. It sold for over 10 million, setting a new record. And like, literally, you can buy it. The jersey, and I guess Jordan, like he wore it in like game one of his final, you know, finals. I think that was against Utah. That was back in '98. Um, I actually watched that series when I was in college, so I remember this stuff. And um, you know, would I want to pay 10 million for a jersey? Probably not. <laughs> not. Not me. But I do understand if someone has a, a a ton of money and you're into this stuff and you've got the cash and you're willing to pay for it, it kind of gives some value. And I'd be curious your guys' thoughts on these things. If, if there's any categories where you agree or disagree, like, you know what, I would pay for the Jordan, I wouldn't pay for the Picasso, or you're like, you know what, I'm not paying for the Jordan jersey, but I would pay uh, for the Picasso. Um, this is a, another example. This is a really funny one, in fact. Um, so I'll, I'll pull this question to you guys. If you could have a portrait, right, this is right here is a portrait of Donald Trump, what would you pay? Uh, and in fact, it went to auction, uh, this portrait. I'm just curious, what would you guys pay for this? Now I've showed you guys other prices of these things. And um, I want to bring back to out of this concept, what is someone willing to pay? Um, this is the greater fool theory. So the basic idea of the greater fool theory is I'm buying something because I think that someone else will buy it for more. That That's basically all that it is. Another way that you can think about it as well is um, <laughs> I'm going to do something dumb uh, because I'm hoping that someone will do something even dumber. <laughs> and, and, and it's funny because um, the market that we were in, you know, we guys went through some crazy NFTs and crypto. And in my opinion, crypto is all based on that kind of stuff. Um, you could make the case, which would somebody have in the comments recently, that stocks are, are similar. Um, I, I would push back a little bit because you are, say, when you buy a stock, you are buying ownership of a business. And if a business is profitable, you are essentially owning part of that profit. So there is some sort of value there, right? Um, whereas this kind of stuff, you're essentially just buying something, hoping that someone will buy it for at least what you paid for, right? You're doing something dumb, hoping that someone else will do something yet more dumb. Um, and uh, it turns out that we are in the Trump thing. Um, his lawyer actually testified saying that um, he organized someone to put up a fake bid to make sure that because Trump's uh, during the auction, his Trump portrait was going to be um, auctioned last. And uh, they they basically paid someone to put up an auction to, to bid to make sure that Trump's thing would be um, the most, the most expensive one. You can see here is the is here is the um, the headline. Trump used charitable funds and a fake bidder to buy a portrait of himself. Here's how the art market makes that possible. And uh, this is more common than you would think. And the basic idea, though, um, is that uh, Trump basically wanted to make sure that he could tweet out just about the charity auction of the celebrity portraits. He stamps in my portrait. Artist Wiggly topped the list at sixty thousand. So um, this is actually more common than not. Um, evidently, what they call this is um, and you see the headline here. Uh, it's called the chandelier uh, bid. And um, the um, this is sort of two different words for this. So one is chandelier bid. The other one is called consecutive bidding. Um, but the basic gist of it is that these are fake bids coming in. And one of the things that I thought was really interesting about this is that when you put something up for sale, say you're a private seller 
um, you tell the 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 art uh, people like Sotheby's or something like that, and you say, you know what, uh, I'm not going to take less than you know 15 million for this thing, and that's like your reserve basically. And so then, what the um, the the artist, uh, the art gallery, or uh, our auctioneer will do is they'll either have fake bids to push the price to your reserve, not telling anyone where the reserve is, or they'll put in fake bids to create excitement among real bidders. So um, I would say learning about this world, there's definitely corruption and definitely scammy um, things in there. So because remember I told you before, um, something's worth what someone else is willing to pay for it. But you're actually not sure in the art world, is there really a, a true buyer behind the actual bid? That is an interesting thing. Um, it's a bit shady, as I suppose what they said. And uh, it reminds me too, is that like a lot of this stuff, it can be criminal. This is another, just for example, um, remember the, the Wolf on Wall Street movie and, and you know, they, they make jokes about, you know, uh, he's going to be hanging out with women, drinking parties, you know, dwarf tarts and this kind of stuff. And um, one of my favorite scenes in the movie, if you guys remember the scene, is um, when they're trying to figure out how to like sneak around money. And uh, what they were doing is, is they were, you know, putting uh, money <laughs> to like people, like taping it on them. And, and essentially one of the advantages of art is it's easier to move money around, right? You're, you're, if you want to do that kind of thing, right? You, you can essentially take millions and millions of dollars and you can put it into like a physical object and you can move it. And it's funny because I, I, I can kind of see uh, the advantage of crypto, just for example, because, you know, you're getting rid of the physical object and you're like, you know what? I just want to move, you know, $11 million around and, and I can just put it in said thing. Now, I'm sure you guys understand it's way uh, more convenient than just taping a bunch of cash. Um, the problem I say crypto, and I'm just bringing it up because I think it kind of relates to sort of the future of this kind of world, is that it's all digital and any number of things can go wrong with that. So there's certainly an advantage to having a physical object. Plus, moreover, um, if you do believe in, say, the Jordan jersey or the Picasso painting or, you know, any kind of physical object that you actually physically, you know, like, like you actually like this thing, um, I would say, you know, that certainly has some sort of real world abstract value or the the, the religious relics that we talked about before. Um, but one of the things that is a real thing there is a criminal element with the art world that is very, very real. Um, and I just showed an example of, you know, it's better to and easier to, to transport art than it is to tape uh, cash to your body. So <laughs> true story. Uh, the other thing is funny the regarding taping stuff to your body. I was thinking about this, if you guys may know, um, people people really do this stuff. It's a real thing. Um, this was a story that I, I saw a few years ago and uh, I used to live uh, in Shenzhen, as I told you guys before. And people like all the time, would, there, there was a footbridge that you would go from Hong Kong to Shenzhen and it would smuggle goods in and out of, of mainland China. And um, this was an example where a guy taped a whole bunch of phones himself. So it really does happen. It's a true story. Was it how many? 94 phones <laughs> to his body. Um, one of the things that was also really interesting about the art world is that it's heavily connected to Wall Street. So one of the um, people who is kind of in charge of the uh, selling of art um, used to work for JP Morgan. His name is, um, he say, is he here? Former banker, David Schrader. Uh, now he's transformed Sotheby's private sales. And um, when they when they talked to him about it, it was really interesting. Um, they asked the question, um, why do clients transact privately instead of at auction? And, and I want to just read his words too, because I think it's a really interesting answer. So um, according to um, uh, Mr. Schrader, he's saying, there are many reasons why people might go either direction. Timing is often a big factor. They might have an immediate need for liquidity, want to buy something new, or it's time to send their grandkids to college. Of course, some might not want to know why anyone to know why they're selling a piece. For example, each private sale is negotiated a uh, bespoke deal and there is more price control. Whereas an auction, you start low to come to a higher number. During private sales, you start high and come to a middle ground. And, um, and then basically he just kind of goes through like, you know, uh, our clients want to stay private. They want an entity and same with buyers, et cetera. So um, there's certainly money laundering in this world, 100%. And this guy was saying he worked in um, finance for 20 years. So, um, this is not unusual. Uh, all this stuff is like in New York City. Um, I think London has a big auction place like this. I wouldn't be shocked if like a Paris. Um, but this sort of big money art world is, is you know, deeply connected. Um, this was an interesting thing about like, say, for example, uh, in Philadelphia. So it's not just like your high class uh, art kind of things. It's also a drug dealers and stuff like that will want to buy art to launder money. So for example, um, you can see here, you can see that the headline. As uh, money launders buy dollies, U.S. looks at lifting the veil on art sales. And um, this was a, a really funny one. Um, I guess, uh, what was this, back in 2011 in Philly. And I went to school in Philly. And actually, so this would have been after I graduated. Um, but uh, they arrested some guy and they found like a whole bunch of cash under a fish tank. And it was like wrapped in like plastic wrappers. So I guess when you um, 
are hiding cash, put it in plastic, <laughs> I guess, especially if it's under a fish tank. And um, one of the things that they were saying, they were saying it turned out Mr. Bel uh, Belciano, that was his name, um, used art to launder some of his drug cash, purchasing works to assemble an established gallery near the Philadelphia Museum Row. So I guess people do that, right? I mean, it, it, because essentially what you're doing, you're buying the art right, with drug money and then you're selling the art and you're getting clean money. That's what laundering is, basically. Um, this, this is more pictures of the money. So that's why some people do this kind of stuff. Um, this is sort of a, a reason why, I say, for example, the Saudi people may be interested in, say, NFTs. I'm just telling you guys, like, this kind of world does have a shady element for sure. Um, Saudi princess on NFTs, they are the next medium of artistic expression. And um, I always laugh because this stuff's so funny. Um, and, and I think we kind of have calmed down on the NFT craze. Um, I remember when it first came out, I was just like, what the heck? Um, I, I think there are some interesting technological things that, to this stuff. But inherently, though, you know, I, I wouldn't mess with this kind of stuff myself. Um, you're also dealing with, for example, um, you would buy art to get rid around sanctions, right? So, for example, uh, rich Russians art buying is target of U.S. crackdown, right? So, again, if you want to move money, one way to do it is art. It, it is a very uh, interesting thing. And the other thing, too, that um, a lot of these kind of people, be it Russian, be it Saudi, be it whoever is dealing with Sotheby's, um, a Saudi prince may like have his friend uh, then use the friend's company. Like, it'll go to like a couple of intermediaries and then they'll make the purchase. So you actually don't even know who's doing it. And if you like sort of pass the money along a couple of times and no one knows who the original buyer is, like that is part of the world. And um, something that it's kind of funny, the Sotheby's or, or Chrissy, these kind of people, these art people, they're kind of like um, Credit Suisse in a way to where they service the ultra rich. Uh, they, they give you your privacy, like we just know you by your account number. And that's just how it goes. Even like something like a Banksy, we don't know who that person is. So um, this is kind of expected. So yes, there is shady stuff in, in the art world. Um, the other thing too, it's not just uh, high art or these auction kind of thing is also in uh, movies. You guys know I, I worked in Hollywood and this is an example that's very, very real. Um, there's a lot of Chinese money in Hollywood and you don't know where that money's coming from. Like you, you don't know. Uh, someone who, yes, yes, is physically coming from China, but 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 you don't know. Like, is it like government money? Is it like some sort of laundering? You you just don't know. And and one of the advantages of um, say movies uh, is that I, I can give my money to a production company. They can make a movie very quickly. And even if the movie either you know loses money or breaks even, that's okay. You just laundered money. Congratulations. So this is a real thing that happens. It's not talked about that much. Actually, I'm just showing you some things. Um, another example that is uh, something that people do with art also. Um, this example, so you can read the, the headline. Billionaire earns first class travel by life. So you get first class travel for life uh, by putting a Mogdalini nude on his American Express. And he bought, he paid like $170 million for this thing. And um, it's funny because one thing that happens, uh, for example, in China, and I can just tell you, um, if you want to move money in and out of the country, the uh, government puts very, very strict uh, regulations on how much cash you can move around. However... Uh, if you just buy an art on on your uh, credit card, um, you're able to move money very quickly. And then again, uh, this is way easier than just taping money to your body. So that's a real thing. Um, also, too, I, I I want to you know disclose that not everyone is a criminal. Just for example, um, so this is a, a Lindsay Schneider. This just came out um, a couple of days ago. It's an article. So she is the owner of In and Out. Um, anyone who's you know lived in like L.A. or California, these kind of things, you don't know what In and Out is. That they're like really awesome hamburgers. Best in in the USA, I would certainly make the case, and I'd love to hear you um, disagree, fight me on that one. But um, point being is that um, this kind of person, right, owner of In-N-Out, and I think her grandfather was a founder, something like that. Um, she'll live in a house of like 11, you know, bedrooms, 13 bathrooms, indoor batting cage, movie theater. This is her house. A game room, just a kitchen and a gym. And they also got a pool, a guest house, tennis court, basketball court, and a two-hole golf course, right? These kind of people, they need to put art in their walls and, you know, this is the kind of stuff you, you would want, because if you have this kind of house, you look, it would be kind of out of place if you don't have some cool stuff. So I don't want you to think that everyone in our world is, is criminal. Not necessarily, right? Um, some people are the element, but some people, you just have so much money. And if you can buy a Picasso, why not? Um, and um, she's saying here, or, or the saying here that um, her home, she sold it for 16.25 and that was at a loss. So um, I, I think this is a really uh, interesting and, and complicated topic. And so I wanted to introduce all these elements to you again. What is something worth? What do you think something, you know, is beautiful or not? And are you willing to pay money for things that you want to put in your house that maybe other people can't have? Um, there's something to be said for that. Another thing that you would think about is what is the value 
of buying something like said act you know how you get that impulsive buy of like oh my god i want to buy a new shirt this kind of thing and you like that feeling of buying something so imagine for those people who have you know uh, billions of dollars not just millions billions of dollars and they're like i'm just gonna you know buy uh, that 10 million dollar painting or that 10 million dollar jersey because i can and i like the way that people look at me when they buy said thing that could be worth something so um, there's a whole sorts of things with, with this. Uh, I myself, you know, um, wouldn't necessarily advocate for these kind of things because it's hard to value something like the Jordan Jersey, for example, because again, a lot of it is based on you're, you're buying it because you think someone else will buy it for more, right? That kind of thing. Um, so anyway, that's my thoughts. Love to hear your thoughts on this stuff as well. What do you think about the art community? Do you think all of the art market's a scam? And um, what do you think? Would you be doing masterworks and these kind of things? So thanks again for watching and I'll catch you next video.